Yours. Thank you. Thank you. Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki aho. Ti hei mori ora. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. So I've just greeted you in Māori, which of course Māori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And this is my great, great, great grandmother, a few greats back anyway. Um, so Mera Tawia. And when she was, this is a painting of her that was done in 1850. And in 1850 in New Zealand, um, the uh, English had just arrived and, and were, had colonised New Zealand. But Māori had really only been in New Zealand for about 750 years. And so when my uh, Māori ancestor was around, New Zealand was a land dominated by birds, which is what you can hear. And so the, the story of New Zealand is quite different from many parts of the world because the arrival of humans was quite late. For a large land mass, the arrival of humans was very late. And so we're seeing playing out in New Zealand now the consequences of relatively recent arrival of um, humans. Of course, the place has changed, and one of the species that have arrived are these vespular wasps, and now in parts of New Zealand, um, particularly late autumn, uh, this is the sound that you hear in many of our forests, rather than birds. So the soundscape of New Zealand has changed from birds in many places to introduce species such as, the, as these wasps, and I will be talking about wasps quite a bit in this talk. But the other major change has been in, this, um, in, in terms of agriculture, and so this is the other sound you hear. <coughs> Maybe cows, cows anyway. And so what's happened in New Zealand has been this transformation from what was primarily a vegetated landscape forest um, with a huge range of endemic species um, to present day forest cover where we only have 23% of the indigenous cover um, remaining. And of course with that massive change in landscape use has been a massive change in the biota of New Zealand. So what am I talking about today? Firstly I want to convince you that New Zealand is a special Place, and I'm going to use um, one of probably our most uh, famous endemic species, the, it's a forest parrot, the kākāpō, um, as, as my example of, of the sort of biota um, that's pretty amazing in New Zealand. And the story of the kākāpō is the story of many of our species in New Zealand. They um, have been in dramatic decline and in, in great trouble in terms of conservation and one of the main problems has been inv invasive predators. And then I'm going to talk more about wasps, which is a lot of my research has been on vespular wasps in New Zealand, and they are a major insect pest. And then I'm going to talk broadly throughout um, about the types of conservation strategies we've needed to ad adopt. Also, apologies, I've spent quite a lot of this last summer um, sailing my yacht <laughs> solo, which means that um, the language gets a bit colourful and I get a bit overexcited at times, so that's what happens when you go yachting on your own. All right, so New Zealand, in terms of biodiversity, um, it's considered one of the bio 25 biodiversity hotspots in New Zealand, which not only means we have a lot of endemic biodiversity, but a lot of it um, is in, in great difficulty. Now, take home message that I want you for today. You've been reading your maps upside down the whole time, right? <laughs> <laughs> the world is, of course, this way up. <laughs> so here's New Zealand here and Sevilla down here. Um, so home for me is almost 20,000 uh, kilometres away. And with that great distance um, comes a whole lot of differences that we have in the, in the taxa. So New Zealand was isolated from Gondwana land, land about 80 million years ago. And there were a whole lot of consequences for our um, biota because of that. 
So we have a lot of species which are flightless, and we see that in birds and in insects. There's a whole lot of taxa that just didn't get to New Zealand, so we're missing a lot of um, mammals, for instance, but a lot of other groups are also poorly represented or not there at all. Um, and as I've already alluded to, um, that's made many of our uh, endemic species um, particularly vulnerable to um, predation and particularly mammalian predators. New Zealand, you may or may not know, is, the, is referred to as Middle Earth. <laughs> so, as the landscapes lent themselves to the Lord of the Rings. Um, I've said we, that we've been isolated, we've got really high levels of endemism, um, and we've got taxa mit, missing. It also means that all sorts of cool stuff has evolved in a different evolutionary kind of context to many parts of the world. Um, and often New Zealand is thought of as a place of these special birds, kākāpō and things. But this I've just used as a couple of examples um, some insects. So this is one of the world's few truly marine insect species. So this is a um, caddisfly that lays its eggs into the starfish. And so the, um, the eggs and then the developing larvae actually develop in a fully marine um, environment. And this is uh, the giraffe weevil with this hugely elongated rostrum, not a neck, but the rostrum. And um, the, the species has got um, very dramatic sexual dimorphism. So this is a male and it's got the antennae on the end of the rostrum and the female is much shorter and squatter and has her antennae way back, sort of halfway down the rostrum. Um, and so therefore she can um, <coughs> bite and burrow her way into the trees and um, uh, lay her eggs without damaging her antennae. Okay, so we've got some pretty cool stuff and we've got some um, major problems because that cool stuff has been isolated for so long. So at current count, we've got um, about 900 of our native species um, are in conservation trouble and another 2,800 declining or at risk. Those are the species we know about. <laughs> of course, um, in many groups, such as the insects, um, we don't even know what we've got there. We've only described about half of our insect fauna. Um, so if we don't have, even have a name of it, we certainly don't know what its conservation status is. But for those that we do know about, there's a relatively high proportion of species that are in big trouble. And um, we do not have the resources um, to deal with all of those on a one-by-one -one basis. Currently, we only have about 250 of those 900 species in conservation programs. So we're doing our best, um, but I would argue it's nowhere near good enough if we're going to try and um, keep at least um, a reasonable proportion of what we've got. So I've used this um, uh, Maxwell paper to set the, um, you know, the, the, the usual problems of um, uh, conservation problems for a range of species, of course, over-exploitation and agricultural activity. An invasive species in a worldwide context sort of falls well down um, the list, but for New Zealand, we have all these other issues as well, but because of that evolutionary context, um, invasion um, is seen as particularly problematic in, in New Zealand. So I'm going to use the kākāpō as, um, to illustrate that. So kākāpō is a very unusual parrot. It's the world's largest parrot. It's the world's only nocturnal parrot. It's flightless. It's herbivorous. It feeds on this ridiculous low-energy diet of chewing on leaves and stripping back um, the, the petioles of things and, and chewing away. Its metabolic rate is only just higher than a rock. All right, so, so it's 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 a very un, unusual bird, and we think it's really really long lived. We don't know because we haven't got individuals that we've followed through for all that long, but um, it's looking that they as though they adults can live up to a hundred years. So these birds. Um, 
you know, I think linked to the fact they've got a, on a low energy diet and a low metabolic rate, they've got a really long, um, they're really long lived and they have a really low breeding rate. So we call them an episodic lek breeder. So that means the males compete for the females. So the males go up to the top of mountain tops and form these track and bowl systems. Um, and I'll show you in a moment. But then when they're up there, the males boom and compete with each other to attract the females in. And it looks looking like once every five or more years, naturally, they will breed. So if you've got a conservation program and you're dealing with a species that might produce one or two young every five years, we're in there for the long haul. So I've been on the Kakapo Recovery Group with the Department of Conservation for the last 17 years or so, um, and we've been desperately trying to save this parrot. Oh, this is the lek system, so um, you can't see all that well, but they're in, this is up high, um, we're way down south of New Zealand, so it's very cold and quite a harsh um, climate, and then this is a track system here, it doesn't look like much, but they form these shallow depressions which help them produce this booming sound. With any luck, this might work. Anyway, if you Google it, um, you'll find a link somewhere. And, and so they've got this very deep boom, boom that they, that they put out. And the males will stay up on top of these high places for weeks on end, booming out. And they lose an incredible amount of weight while they're doing this. Um, and uh, the hope is that a female comes along. Now, sadly, for um, Kākāpō on the um, main South Island of New Zealand, um, they got down to just 18 birds left, um, and they were all males. So these poor males were trekking to the top of the mountains and booming out for weeks and weeks and weeks, and there weren't any females. So at that point um, in the 1970s, we thought it was too late. We thought we only had a few birds left, and they were all males, and it doesn't matter what strategies you use, you're not recovering from that. Fortunately, um, in the late 70s, they discovered a small population on Stewart Island, um, and they, um, as soon as they started to track them and, and look at what was happening, it became very clear that um, cats, which were on Stewart Island, were um, really problematic for these um, birds, and what they were finding is um, just piles of um, bones. So the decision was made at that point that this was probably a population that was well on its way out and that we, they would capture all remaining birds and transfer through them off to islands which didn't have um, cats. So that was done um, in the, over the next few years. So New Zealand um, for quite some time had been aware that these invasive mammalian um, pests were a, a problem. And way back in um, about 1954-ish, um, we started getting better at removing rodents um, from islands. And in recent decades, we've got better and better until we've, by 2001, we were able to clear an 11,000 hectare island of, of rats. And so we've greatly added to the number of offshore islands um, where we've removed rats and uh, recently we've started having a go at um, uh, stoats and rabbits and, and a, rank, a suite of, of um, mammalian predators. Not that rabbits are predators, but anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, so it was hoped that by taking these kākāpō and putting them onto offshore islands without the predators that we'd have a good shot at um, the species recovering. It didn't quite work out as nicely as that. So by 1995, we were down to just 51 kākāpō left. So here are the birds that were found on Stewart Island in Orange. So those are the ones that the cats were having a go at. So gradually, we were shifting them from Stewart Island onto these offshore islands that didn't have the mammalian predators. Here's our few Fiordland males. Um, which some of them just died out, we suspect, because they were really old, and a few of them were transferred onto the offshore islands. But what we were really hoping to see is this red 
dots along the top increasing. We were hoping for that once we put them onto these offshore islands, they would start reproducing. And by 1995, um, we were in panic mode because clearly just shifting them onto the islands hadn't worked. There was very little breeding going on and we could see that our 51 birds were just gradually declining. So about that stage, there was a national rethink on how to do it. We restructured the program and we started a um, program of really intensive management. So we were providing supplementary food for the birds. We were intensively managing the nests. All the ch um, nests and chicks were monitored. Um, and anything that looked at in, as though it was in trouble was pulled from the nest and we were hand raising them. So these were birds that would normal, normally naturally die, but we were down to so few birds we went, actually we can't afford any mortality in this population, we're going to rescue whatever we can. So we were hand feeding, um, managing um, them all, and then we realised that we started to see problems with um, genetic issues because we'd got down to so few birds. So when we started looking at sperm motility, for instance, we were seeing a lot of double-headed or double-tailed sperm. It was clear that we had a lot of issues with um, uh, fertility in these birds. And so we've also started a program looking at artificial insemination. That's still um, not yet paid off for us, but we suspect long-term we're going to have to um, start uh, getting some success there. So I showed you the graph up to here, 1995, when we were panicking. We started the intensive management and now look where we're at with the breeding. Woohoo, we're now up to, I think, a last count, 151 birds. So it's been a fantastic success story, except notice what's happening. We've got these long periods of not much happening <laughs> and then we get, um, a, a, a really good breeding year, uh, which we had last year, um, was really good. And I don't, I don't expect we'll be <laughs> seeing another one for a while. And so what's causing that is pulses in the seed production of the trees down there. So it turns out that these birds are synchronising their um, breeding with the production of mass fruiting events. And the mass fruiting events aren't all that frequently, particularly in the south of New Zealand. Um, and so it's just going to take a long time to gradually get these birds up there. So we're not out of the woods yet. 150 birds is not a lot of <laughs> birds in the world. Uh, but we're on the right direction, right? And I think we've got a re really good formula. But it's intensive. It takes a lot of people and a lot of work. Um, and, of course, the politicians who like quick success stories, they're not wanting something that we can say in, you know, in 50 years' time, it's going to be looking good. Um, and the other issue is once we've got up to 150-odd birds, we've run out of places to put them. It's kind of a nice problem to have, but these birds take a lot of space. As soon as you have the density too high, the birds start fighting, and the, particularly the males start interfering with the nests. So we tend to have a surplus of males, so we take surplus males and we put them onto the Naughty Boys Island, um, just to keep them out of the way for now. Um, but at some stage we're going to have to get to grips with needing more space, and so the pressure on the program overall now is to find ways that we can get rid of mammalian predators off larger areas of, um, of islands. I think, ah oh yes, and I mentioned the fact that we've, we've, we do have um, genetic issues which may bite the program long term because there's not, I mean the genetics are what, what they are. So at the moment um, there's a program to um, do the genome of every single living bird. Um, I'm not sure where that actually gets us to in the long run but um, basically with this species we've thrown every bit of science at it we can. Um, and so, it, I mean, I count it as a success story. We've gone from a bird that actually I didn't think we had a chance with um, to a bird that is at least in the right direction now. But we can't do that for all 900 species in New Zealand, all right? This is, I mean, people keep throwing stones at this program because it is so expensive and it's such so many resources. We can't do that with all of them. And so 
you know, a lot of the effort now is going to dealing with the actual issues um, rather than work, trying to work through species by species. And for ma many parts of New Zealand, that means dealing with invasive species. Which is why, if you ever, who's come to New Zealand? Has anybody f made the pilgrimage 20,000 k's <laughs> of it to get to New Zealand? Nobody. Well, if you arrive at our border, you will find that there's very strict biosecurity controls, all right? You are not allowed to bring all sorts of things into New Zealand. So no fresh fruit or vegetables, nothing that could transfer pests. And um, uh, so Australia and New Zealand are the two countries probably in the world, maybe Hawaii as well, that take biosecurity extremely strictly. And it's quite bewildering, I think, for visitors to New Zealand to get you know, why are they <laughs> so uptight about biosecurity? But the story I've just told you is why. But it's not only affecting our native species, of course, a lot of our agricultural systems have been built off the fact that we are isolated in many places, pest-free. So every time we get another incursion of a fruit fly or, or whatever, um, it affects us economically as well as environmentally. Anyway, strict border control can work. So here's the rate of non-native mammals arriving in New Zealand in the black um, triangles and Europe. So you guys are keep adding to your species all the time. More and more things are coming. New Zealand, in a you know, um, I guess a really tight regulation started coming in mid 1980s ish, um, and by doing that, we've actually capped the number of um, arrivals in some taxa. It's not true of all taxa. We still really struggle um, with invertebrates and with diseases is um, a major issue. Okay, so on to the pests. We do tend to focus an awful lot in New Zealand on m mammals, but there are other species that we need to worry about as well. And so a lot of my research over the decades has been looking at um, invasive Vespidae. So this is a, a global exercise we, we did with some colleagues around the world, just looking at the rate these things were being spread around the world. Um, so this is, the, the line is the cumulative number of species um, going into new areas. And essentially there's no sign of it plateauing off. These social insects are renowned for being really good at spreading because they you don't you only need one inseminated female often to and off goes a new population so these things are spreading and will continue to spread and how are we doing for time being not what wobble on for too long um, and so uh, these things are are getting all, all around the world when you look at the known ecological impacts there's really seven species um, of, of Vespida the, that are um, considered invasive. And one of them's just come your way. So Vespa velutina, this Asian hornet, um, arrived in France in 2004 and has been spreading ever since. First documented in northern Spain in 2010. I don't know if it's been seen. Does anyone know if it's been seen down this far yet? I don't know. Keep, keep your eye. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Basically, when this arrives to New Zealand, I quit working on <laughs> invasive um, Vespidae because this, I think this has got a really nasty sting and it's, it's not fun. Anyway, these things are being spread around, um, but New Zealand, again, is an interesting um, place for invasive ve Vespidae because we have no native social wasps um, and no native social bees and only 11 species of ant. So if you want to work on native social insects, New Zealand is not the place to be. <laughs> You've got 11 species of ant and that's it. Go across to the ditch to, the, to Australia and you have um, a thousand plus species of native ant. So, um, but we do have a number of species of these exotic Vespidae that have arrived and really flourished because it's a huge ecological gap. There's no... There's no parasites of these things, there's no predators of these things. It's a great climate for them and they've just gone ballistic. So if you look at the arrival dates of these things, some of them have been in for a long time. So 
this Australian paper wasp arrived in sometime in the late 1800s. And some of them um, are, are really recent. So last year we had another species of Polistes added, and that's the European um, Dominula, which I suspect is in Spain. It's right across most of Europe. Uh, so that's only just arrived um, and established. It had established already in two parts of the country before anybody realised and was decided it was way too late to do anything about. But the real problematic species turn out to be these two vestibular species, one that sh which arrived at the end of the Second World War, War, and we know exactly when and how it arrived. It arrived in aircraft parts that were being shipped around the world as part of the war thing. Um, but we had no control tools at that time, and so this, that thing took off. Um, and then Vulgaris, the common wasp, arrived in the 1970s. We don't know exactly when because it looks very similar to Germanica. You've got to look closely between the eyes to be able to discern the, between the two species. So it had been here for a while, well here, it had been in New Zealand for a while before we um, realised that we had a second species. But between the two of them, um, we've got some major issues. So the impacts um, are widespread um, across a number of sectors, and I'm not going to go into the e economic or social implications, other, right, other than that you all know that wasp things really hurt and they're nasty. So when you've got, um, actually New Zealand's got the, now the highest densities of vespula recorded anywhere in the world by an order of magnitude. So when you've got really high densities of vespula, that causes all sorts of problems for people in the outdoors, and there's all sorts of economic problems. But what I've been really concerned about and focused on is the ecological impacts. Pause. Gosh, this room's hot. Is this hot for you? It's very hot for somebody from New Zealand. <laughs> all right. So what do vespula do? Um, one of the first things that we noticed is that they really like sweet things, so sugar. And it turns out in New Zealand we have trees that have an endemic scale insect at really high abundance, and they produce these lovely little drops of honeydew on the end of a waxy filament. And so essentially in these forests that have the scale insect, we have sugar-coated trees. So the trees, if you look up, there's just a whole lot of little lights um, and we did a little bit of work, I think 3,000 kilos of honeydew per hectare per year is produced. So it's massive quantities of freely available sugar. If you were designing wasp parasit paradise, you would coat your trees in sugar, right? <laughs> okay, so when they arrived in these forests, mostly around the world, vespular wasps are limited by um, the availability of sugar. If you've got forests that are just pa packed with large amounts of sugar, then they're not any longer limited by sugar, they're limited by protein. Um, so that turns out to be a real problem because the, this is why we get such massive densities of wasps in these forests, because of that availability of sugar. So we did some experimental work back in the late 90s, putting out... Uh, caterpillars and uh, spiders to see to just try and get a handle on the on the predation rate and the answer was that the predation rates were so high you actually had to reduce the abundance of vespula by about 90 percent if you wanted um, those uh, groups to be able to to make it through so you needed a huge um, reduction in the number that we had let's see if this is going to work Voila. So we did our experiments on uh, caterpillars and spiders, but wasps aren't just targeting those groups. They target anything that moves. And so this is one of the large endemic stick insects. Um, I've seen them take the giant dragonflies. They just come and clip the wings, and then, and then they um, hollow them out. So we've done quite a bit of work looking at the, the diet of these things. They're very broad, generalist. Um, feeders, and um, they've been um, hammering away at um, a huge diversity of our invertebrates. 
I can't really see my watch. <laughs> All right, I'll just quickly mention this. So we did some experimental work on a, on a large scale where we were poisoning out wasps to reduce their abundance in a large, over relatively large areas, 30 hectares. So we had two sites where we poisoned and reduced wasp um, abundance and two non-poison sites. Before we poisoned, you can see that the native insects we were catching and the malaise traps were more or less similar. So there's no difference between the red and the green. Okay. After we poisoned, voila, don't you love that? You don't, as an ecologist, you don't often get a nice <laughs> multi-dimensional plot um, just dropping out like that. So very clear difference between the community after we'd poisoned where we had fewer wasps and where we had lots of wasps. So we know that they were hammering them at the individual level. We've got good evidence that they were also um, having a substantial effect at the community level. We had a bit of a look to see whether um, wasps removing all that sugary honeydew um, made a difference to the actual ecosystem function. So we were looking at um, decompos litter decomposition and carbon sequestration, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but the answer was that wasps were actually increasing the sequestration of carbon by about 40%. So that's quite a significant um, ecosystem function impact that they're likely to be having. So essentially they're disrupting the energy flow through those systems as well via the soil food web. So all sorts of impacts. As I said, they like sugar. This is... Um, a different type of forest in New Zealand and a different type of scale insect, still an endemic insect. And you can see how much sugar you can get on some of these trees. Um, and it turns out that the wasps um, not only are focusing in on this honeydew, but these trees are also have a floral resource and the wasps are really dominating the flowers as well. So likely that they're having... Um, and influence you know, right across that, that sugar resource system. The next study was one that wasn't supposed to be a wasp study. Every time I'd go and do some, try and do something else, it comes back to wasps in New Zealand. So I had a student that was looking at um, a palm uh, in New Zealand, an Nikol palm, which is relatively common. And this is an area where, um, in northern New Zealand, where um, there was some vertebrate pest control that had been going on for 10 years. So a community group had gone in and they were killing off all the stoats and the um, uh, rats and things. And the hope of the community group was that that would restore all sorts of elements of the forest. And so we went in and we were looking at the floral visitors on these Nikau flowers hoping that the vertebrates would restore, i.e. the birds and the um, geckos and things. Um, but that certainly wasn't the case after 10 years, and all we found that was the, the flowers were absolutely um, dominated by the Vespula wasps again. Vespula wasps are unlikely to be really good pollinators because they're not very hairy, but given the density that, um, of them that there are, it's possible that they're um, helping to plug the gap of no birds at all being there. All right. Um, birds. So wasps potentially can also affect birds because there's been documented cases of them attacking nestling birds. So any bird that's trying to breed at the time of wasps, it's um, a reasonably good guess that they'll be, um, that the young birds are going to be attacked. So we did have a go at trying to look at the, um, whether we were getting a decline in bird populations that was attributable to wasps, and we certainly were getting a decline in bird populations over the, well, we had a 30-year data set. The problem was that all sorts of other things have changed in that time as well. So obviously trying to do a 30-year um, experiment, uh, it's not going to be a 30-year controlled experiment. And we've got changes in... Um, particularly in uh, some of the possums and, and rodent densities as well. So we couldn't attribute it directly to wasps, but um, it potentially the, the, it could play a role. So we've left a question mark f for birds, 
but otherwise, in virtually every other part of the system where we've gone and measured, um, these introduced wasps are having um, an impact and actually a significant impact. So for a species that's, you know, essentially um, altering your system at, at a whole range of different um, trophic levels, um, we've got a major problem. Which is the other side of our work, um, looking at how we can try and control vespular wasps. So again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the detail of this. Um, but we've tried biological control with two species. Um, this is a um, ichneumonid parasitoid, which doesn't have a common name, I'm afraid. But it was um, a species that was collected from Europe, um, Switzerland actually, and um, brought back to New Zealand. It established and we tracked it through for 20 years and discovered that it was having no significant impact on the population. Um, all sorts of reasons why that might be, but the, the bottom line is that it, it wasn't giving us significant control. The people doing the biocontrol work then went off to the USA and imported what they thought was um, a similar, uh, well, was the same um, species, but it turned out to be a subspecies, um, the Sparum burra. And in actual fact, at the time that they did that work, we thought that, well, they thought that the vespular, what they'd called vespular vulgaris in the USA was the same as the vespular vulgaris we had in New Zealand. It turned out when people did um, uh, some more detailed work that they had misidentified their vespular vulgaris and it wasn't at all, it was Alaskensis, a completely different species. And the parasitoid turned out to be a different species. So it's not surprising that burra um, didn't even establish because we had the wrong species of parasitoid and the wrong species of, <laughs> of wasp. So that's what happens if you, I mean, r these were back in the days when molecular tools weren't widely used, at least not in New Zealand. What has been more successful is poison baiting. So vespular wasps feed by trophallaxis, so the adults cannot digest the protein themselves. They have to take the protein back to the colony they feed it to the developing larvae. The larvae add the digestive proteins and then they sort of spit this pre-digested soup back to the um, colony and it gets passed around. That's a fantastic way to get, pro uh, to, to get a toxin into the colony. So if you can attract your wasp into a protein, they'll take it back to the um, colony along with the toxin and it gets spread around. So we tried a range of different toxins, but fipronil turned out to be really effective. Um, actually, I think a lot of social insects are highly susceptible to the effects of fipronil. Um, and so we were able to get away with a really wide bait spacing, which meant we could piggyback off the same spacing that we were using for rodent control. And we were getting really effective knockdowns. So 90% of the colonies were killed. Um, a number of countries around the world that have problems with Vespula were getting quite excited, particularly Argentina, Hawaii and Australia. And it all worked really nicely, um, except that the, the commercialisation of it was problematic, shall we say. <laughs> Long story, I won't go into that. So this is um, uh, looking at the cumulative number of Vespula wasps in Malay's traps with a poisoned and a non-poisoned area. So this is, if you don't poison, the numbers just keep going up and un, up and up over February, March for us is autumn, of course, <laughs> spring for you, but over autumn, the numbers just keep going up. If you use this um, fipronil poison bait, then you can get a dramatic reduction in numbers with just a single application of the fipronil. Oops, what did I do? Wrong one. So the poison was just a one-day operation here and we were get, able to get a significant um, reduction in, in wasps. Fantastic. Um, but when we went um, to the northern forest to, to have a go at this, so the people up um, in, around Auckland area were also wanting to use this control because they had issues with wasps in their area 
but it turned out, I've put it on the same scale as the last one, the number of wasps in these forests is just vastly different. So if I flip back again, it's gone from this to this. And this is the difference with the presence and absence of honeydew. So these forests do not have the large quantities of the scale insects that produce the honeydew. And this is more like the density of wasps that you'd expect anywhere else in the world, Europe or, or wherever. Um, so it's just really highlighting um, the huge difference in population density. But also when you're trying to um, control down at this level, I mean, we didn't even have good control tools for measuring density down at that level. So more work to be done then. There's the Vespex wasp bait. We finally got it um, commercially available in New Zealand um, just 2016 and it's been actually it, <laughs> the company that now produces it um, discovered there was such a huge demand for it that the whole thing's um, got a little bit out of hand for them but hopefully they're catching up with supply now. But all sorts of um, you know, homeowners and batch owners have found that this is a really effective way of controlling wasps. But we've still got an issue with trying to do it on a really large scale. So going out and putting out toxic baits works fine on a small scale, but trying to do it, in fact, we got up to, I think we did it over a thousand hectares, but we've got ten tens of thousands, millions of hectares that we need to do with, and it's not practical. So the government's recently invested um, more money in um, using a, what we call the National Sciences Challenges, and Vespula has been one of those areas where they've decided to put some more money. So we've now got groups at um, a number of research institutes in New Zealand. Each have picked off a, a new technique to try and have a look at, and I'm not going to go into the different techniques, but you know, th there's a, diff a range of uh, different ones. But where my work comes in is with these eradication strategies. Um, we're going to have a go using the um, poison baiting, um, potentially, to see if we can get rid of wasps off small islands. So if you remember back to that graph that I showed you of getting rid of rodents off islands, we didn't start with big massive islands, we started with tiny islands and we got good at doing that and then we scaled up. So that's kind of where we want to, to try um, with this in New Zealand now, is now that we've got a good uh, poison baiting tool, um, we want to have a go at, at some of the islands. If you'd asked me a few years ago, um, was that sensible, I'd have said, oh no, the queens travel too far and they'll just reinvade and there's no real point. And then I discovered um, accidentally by talking to people that worked on mammal eradications that we'd actually already eradicated wasps off islands accidentally. Nobody knows why or how, but on some of these islands where we'd been targeting mammals, um, at least these three islands, it looks like we've also somehow eradicated wasps. I say somehow because we use the different sized islands over different times, they use different toxins, none of them were insect toxins, they were mammal specific, brodificum. So who knows what's going on there, but it's um, an interesting lead that we're we'll be trying to follow up on. Well, that's just showing you some of the cool things that are still on these offshore islands that, um, where we've got rid of the, the rodents. All right, and so the only other thing I, um, I learnt on this long journey, um, so I had two boys along the way, and if you take your kids out and do lots of field work with them and put them beside wasp nests and say, count the wasps going in and out and, and whatever, help me dig the wasp nest, then you're likely to end up with adrenaline junkies. <laughs> So this is son one who spends all his time jumping out of aeroplanes, and this is son two who races around in yachts. But the good side of it is, this was taken last week with son two, you also get to climb mountains with them. So go out and enjoy your families. <laughs> all right, so finally, um, hopefully I've um, convinced you that New Zealand's got some real cool biota that we want to try and conserve. And we know that a lot of it is really invulnerable to introduce predators, mammal and insect. Um, but we're not, we just, I don't think we do, we're getting there. We, you know, we're, 
we're losing um, too many species too rapidly still. And I think we need some real step changes in how we're approaching conservation. Some of it might come from these new novel tools, RNAi or, or whatever else. Um, and some of it might just be a rethink in the strategies that we use, such as let's have a go at eradicating wasps from islands. I don't have all the answers by any means. It's sort of, I, it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of smart thinking to get there. But that's where I think we should be heading. All right, that's me. Thank you. Oh.